As I look around and I see all the works your hands have made, the awesomeness of you and how your love has never failed me. Words cannot express what I feel inside. I can't describe your glory divine, but as a token of my love, this is what I'll do. I'll lift my hands and cry. There are not enough words that I can say to tell you how much I appreciate all the wonderful things you've given me. Your loving kindness, your tender mercies. I don't know why you would love me, why you would show me so much mercy. Why you suffered and died for me way back on Calvary. But I, I thank you. Wonderful, holy, holy, and righteous, victorious, Sunday. 
Pharaoh by the angels, born in a lonely manger. The Virgin Mary was his mother, and Joseph was his earthly father. Three wise men came from afar. They were guided by a shining star to see the baby where he laid in a manger filled with hay. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, oh.
appears and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices as for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Oh, on your knees, oh, hear the angels' voices. On night, people. His name forever. 
Jesus, who is so righteous and holy and absolute pure love, came down to earth, leaving his heavenly home above. He was born without spots, wrinkles, blemish, or sin. So let us now behold this perfect lamb and accept him so we may live again. Now behold the lamb, the precious lamb of God, born into sin, that I may live again, the precious lamb of God. Now behold the Lamb, the precious Lamb of God, born into sin that I may live again. He's the precious Lamb of God. When I always didn't do right, I went left, you told me to go right, but I'm standing right here in the midst of my tears, and Lord, I claim you to be the Lamb of God. Thank you for the Lamb, the precious Lamb of God. Because of your grace, because of your grace, I can finish this race.
So good to see each of you, and uh, let me say that my prayer is that you will have a blessed Christmas. I know that that word is just banded around, but I mean it uh, sincerely, a gracious Christmas, and maybe more than that, uh, not so much a prosperous new year, because when we use the word prosperous, many people think about material blessings. But you can have material blessings and then be starved on the inside. So my prayer is that for 015, that each of you and your families, that um, your faith will get stronger for next year, you get closer to the Lord. And that his peace that goes beyond what we don't understand will guard your minds and keep your hearts. Amen. As you know, we have been in the 103rd Psalm, Psalm 103. And we've been taking it in segments instead of just trying to cram down the whole psalm at one time in order to totally understand what David is saying here and then how it applies to you and me in terms of our daily living and our walk with the Lord. I want to conclude the, um, our discussion on this psalm and we want to look at verses 19 to 22, which are the last verses and this, and we know that David in this psalm, it is just uh, saturated and drenched with God's mercy. Everything that he says, it's a, um, a symbol of gratitude and thankfulness, not just for the big things in life, but for just God being God and just loving us and loving him. Let us all stand together and let, let's read those verses together, those last verses, verses 19 to 22, Psalm 103, the 103rd Psalm. And I think they, uh, he has it on the screen, doesn't it? Okay. Are we ready? Let's read it together. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, hearkening the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen. You may be seated. I think it was last Sunday, either Sunday before last, I gave a um, somewhat of a breakdown in terms of studying this psalm, which would make it uh, 
clearer and easier to get all of the, um, the different truths that David is lifting here. I want to give another breakdown. This one is much shorter. I think the other one that I gave, it was broken down into five segments. Well, this one will be broken down into three segments. In fact, you can take both of them, put them together. David, in this psalm, and you can see it from the beginning, this psalm has no meaning to the unsaved. In fact, persons who are not in Christ really cannot say this psalm. This psalm is for the redeemed of the Lord, for those that are in Christ, for those that know him personally. Now, the breakdown that I looked at, trying to make it a little bit more palatable, or if you want to say divisions, we know that David is expressing gratitude to the God of grace. And the first breakdown will be the first five verses, verses 1 to 5, where David addresses himself. And he talks about in terms of um, stirring up the sluggishness of his spirit, his soul somewhat becoming excited about what God has done for him. And, and I think in verse 4 and 5, then he names some of the blessings that God has bestowed upon him in his life, saving him, keeping him from being destroyed by the enemy, material things, and he goes on. Then the second uh, segment here, verses 6 to 18, David recalls the mercy of God to all of those who are part of God's covenant love. And the word covenant means that God has what? He has given a promise. And that promise is to those that are in Christ, I will never what? Leave you, neither will I forsake you. And then third, the third part of this, verses 19 to 22 that we just read, he summons the whole of creation to join him in the chorus of of praise. And then he ends it with the same thing that he began the psalm in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and everything, all that is within me, every particle of my being, because basically he's made me. And in making me, then I owe what? I owe gratitude and thanks to him for what he has done in the past, what he's doing now, and what he promises he's going to do. So I title these last few verses, Worshiping the King. And I think that that fits in beautifully with Christmas about three, four days away. And as a choir was singing about the child being born in Bethlehem and the three wise men, what, that came with their gifts. And let me maybe at that, at that juncture, uh, unless you understand it, where Scripture says three wise men is not talking about necessarily men of, um, of uh, wit and insight. But basically, these Magi's, they were astronomers. They studied the stars. And, uh, and history tells us that they possibly came from Babylon following, and they had calculated this. And they brought gifts. In fact, they went to Herod, and they said, Herod, where is he who is what? King. We want to what? Worship him. And that's what we're doing here this morning. Amen. We are worshiping the king. There, there was a nursery rhyme that was written in 1883. 
and I'm going to I'm going to repeat that nursery rhyme, and it's going to be quite familiar to you. You remember Humpty Dumpty? Can you say it with me? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And, and the picture of Humpty Dumpty is in the shape of an egg. And he's sitting there on the wall, and the egg falls off. And naturally, we know how fragile and delicate eggs are. Now, this was written as a nursery rhyme. But it was also a satire about King George III during his reign. And... Most likely, possibly, some of the people didn't understand what the writer was saying. But he was talking about the king and his policies. And in terms of what he was doing that was destroying the nation. In fact, he was king over Britain or, or England and then Ireland. And uh, for an example... Uh, the policies that he enforced had caused the colonial colonies in America to revolt. And you remember hearing this, uh, this phrase, uh, taxation without representation? You remember that? Okay. And uh, I think the revolt was in, uh, what, the uh, revolution was in 1776 when the uh, colonies, 13 colonies, decided that no longer is the king of England going to tell us what to do, how to do it. He's not going to control our lives. We're going to control our own destiny. And so, but anyway, you, you know about the uh, revolution. And this nursery rhyme of Humpty Dumpty was pointing to the king and telling him, if you don't change in terms of your policies and your laws, then your kingdom is going to be shattered. It's going to be destroyed. And then notice it says that all the king's horses, all the king's men, what? Couldn't put Humpty back together again. There's a book that I start, that I read all oh, the way back about 10, 15 years ago, and I came across it again the day before yesterday. It's a lovely book, and it has gems of of spiritual wisdom in it, and I recommend that you uh, try to buy it. It's called What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey, a great book. What is Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. And Philip Yancey, in that book, he quotes, he makes a statement, and I'm going to quote this statement exactly as he gives it in the book. He says, man is born broken. He lives by mending. The grace of God is glue. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. Humpty Dumpty couldn't be put back together. All of the uh, knights and all of the, all the parliament could not... Uh, undo the damage that King George III had done. They couldn't turn the tide. But Philip Yes in his book says that we are like Humpty Dumpty. And when we come in this world, we don't come in this world complete, whole, great, satisfied. We come in this world what? Splintered, broken apart. And he uses the uh, thought that God is the glue that holds us together. You remember the illustration, the lesson that God was trying to teach Jeremiah? And Jeremiah had been crying and telling God that uh, by the time the Babylonians got through with the nation, that they would be lost and possibly never would be heard of again. And God sent Jeremiah down to somebody's house. You remember that? It was a potter's house. And 
God told Jeremiah, I want you just to watch the potter, how he's making pottery. And he would take lumps of clay and he would shape it and squeeze it and he would uh, push it and try to shape it into what the vision that he had in his own mind. And if it didn't look right, he would just pull it apart, throw it back in the batch, and start over again. And God was telling Jeremiah, this is how my people are. They are broken. They are destroyed. But I know how to what? Mend them. I know how to what? Heal them. I know how to bring them back together again. And God has been doing that ever since the Garden of Eden. David says here in these last few verses in Psalm 103, he says, God is what? Worthy to be praised. Now sometimes we glibly, uh, we glibly say that uh, as a religious platitude, but we really don't understand nor grasp the essence of what we are saying. God is worthy to be praised. Well, first of all, why is he worthy? What is, what is in God that is of value that captures my attention that causes me to want to worship him? Amen? Have you ever asked yourself those questions? Or is coming to a service, has it become so much of a habit? Has it become so much of a uh, mechanical thing that when you come, your physical body is here, but your mind is going everywhere out there? Have you ever had that to happen? All, when you come to service, all of you ain't there? You, you, some of you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. And you have to start praying and ask God to what? To focus your mind, to clean out your heart, and to get you what? Riveted on why am I here? Who did I come to praise? And the answer is simple. God. Why? Because he loved me first. He taught me how to love. He blesses me with his mercy. Because if you read the beginning of this psalm, David talks about in terms of how merciful God is. In fact, in verse 8, sets the stage for the rest of the verses where he makes two negative statements, then he gives three positive illustrations, then he gives a contrast. The negative statements are this, that God, that we deserve to be punished. We deserve God's judgment. We deserve God's wrath. But God, he holds back his anger. He, he puts a grip on in terms of how long, and can I say this way, when he has to whip us, he's not going to whip us till he kills us. He's just going to whip us enough to awaken us to the fact that our lives, and I heard this the other day, that we were not born to a life of good times. Sounds good, don't it? Amen? I think somebody in there is thinking about what you're going to eat for Christmas and yeah, yeah, I know. You, you, you get visions of sugar plums dancing in your head. Oh, yeah. Your mind ain't here this morning. We did not come into this world to have a good time. Life is not a party. Life is hard. It's rough. And like I said so many times, life ain't fair. Because things, some things that happen to folk that shouldn't happen, and then the folk that it should happen to, it don't happen. Does that make sense? 
it looks like wrong goes unpunished. And right is what? Devastated. For an example, last week, the two policemen that were just arbitrarily just shot sitting in their cars. And then the gentleman that did it before he committed suicide and killed himself, uh, I don't know whether the statement was, he wrote it down, but anyway, it came through the news that you kill one of us, we get two of you. Hatred, malice, anger, blackness of heart. Amen? What we, the scene that we see today in society, it looks like there is no conscience anymore. No more moral values. And whenever moral values and consciousness are thrown out the window, then you know what happens? God also is thrown out the window. And when you throw God out the window, who are you going to praise and worship then? Yourself. I am God. And there's no one better than I am. But God says, no matter in terms of what you think about yourself, you can't do what I do. And whether you acknowledge the fact or not, you will always, you always will owe me praise and gratitude and thanks. Even when you're not aware of it. When you are laying down last night and you went into a deep sleep, what they call it, REM sleep, in it, where you're not, you know, you're not listening, but you get caught up in that dream and you don't know where you're at. Sometimes you don't even know what the dream is all about. Well, who keeps my heart palpitating? Who keeps my lungs pumping and air going in them? I'm not controlling that. When you and I woke up this morning, somebody, somewhere, didn't open their eyes. Were they better than I am? Could have been. Were they worse than I am? Could have been. I don't know, but I do know this. God is a merciful God. And he's allowed all of us to see what? Almost the conclusion of another year. Go back to January 1 of this year and come all the way up to this present moment, which is 12, 15, 16, if my watch is right. Has everything this year gone beautifully in your life? Has everything this year gone wonderful? Have you gotten everything that you wanted? Have you had any problems? Have you been in a heartache? Have you had some health breakdowns? But whatever you went through in almost 365 days, you're still here. And you're still here, not because you necessarily persevered, that's fine, but you know, you can persevere and still die. But because of the mercy of God. Amen? Therefore, because God is a king, he's worthy of worship. Kings are supposed to be worshipped. Kings are born to be worshipped. Where is the one born king of the Jews? Therefore, we must what? Worship God. David tells us in these verses, God stays the same. He never changes. God is not hindered nor hampered nor is he controlled by time and space. He transcends. He's larger than time and space. When you look at who we are, our time is limited here. Three score and ten, seventy some years. Four score, Sister White, God bless, eighty years. Maybe another score, ninety. But and then some people are super blessed, and I use that terminology, to go six score. But still, no matter how many scores we live here, what? 
One day those scores are what? Cut off. And David talks about that. And he uses the illustration, we just like a flower in, a, in, in, a, in the field. The wind blows over it as it is blossoming. And the flower, what? Is blown away. It withers and it dies. And he even goes so far to say that the ground that the flower grew up in after a while doesn't even remember that the flower was there. We are transitory. A little while. God is eternal. All the while. Then David goes on and he says that all creation, I want you to join in praise. He begins with the angels, the angelic hosts, messengers of God. And then he goes on to the second tier, the angelic armies of God. In other words, like the prayer that God gave the disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come here where we are. My home, my life, my church, my city, my government, as it already has been established, what? In heaven. The prayer says we want earth to be like heaven. The peace, the joy, the excitement, the praise up there, we want it down here. Isn't it odd but yet sad that God at times has to beg us to praise him? Dust that he blew his breath into to become a living soul. He's got to get our attention. We get wrapped up in our schedules, in our living. In fact, we become so wrapped up in life until sometimes we neglect our families, our children, and the only thing that we are focused on is me, what I want to achieve. And God stands, I'm sure, in the shadows waiting for us to come to our senses, realizing that whatever I have, God opened a door or closed a door to keep me from becoming injured or hurt, mercy. He kept from me what I deserve to receive, but because he loves me, he did not let it come to me. Mercy. Then David ends where he says all of creation, all of creation, animals, fish, fowl, everything, join me, and so to speak. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and everything that is in me, what? Bless his holy name, his worthy name. Because of who he is, he deserves to be praised. We use the term incarnation as it relates to Jesus being born in Bethlehem, which means that God wrapped himself in our skin and came down here to live among us without any sin, not born with sin, but to show us what the Father is like. A uh, 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 Moses wanted to see God, couldn't see him. All of the old patriarchs wanted to see God. So it looked like God said, okay, you want to see me? You want to know what I'm like? I'm going to send my son. And you look at him. Watch him, that's me. We, all, we oftentimes use, uh, use these examples in terms of a son and a father. And we say that boy looks just like his daddy. And most of the time we mean in terms of physical resemblance. But you know what? There are many times that that boy will take on the characteristics of the father. 
he would take on the attitude and the thinking of the daddy. Well, when Jesus came, in the second chapter of Philippians, we are told that he laid aside his prerogatives in terms of his attributes, and he became like you and me. He hurt physically. He was disappointed like we are. He was abused the way we are. He was talked about and lied on the way that we are. Everything that you and I go through, he went through it. So I can't say that he doesn't understand, even though in my emotional upheaval at times, I might say, well, God doesn't understand me, but he does. Then later on, when I come now, I realize he understands more about me than I know he understands. Oh, yes, he understands my pain, my hurt, my disappointments, my anger, all of that roll into one. He understands it. Why? He went through it way before I came on this planet. And he knows what's happening in my life. Really, what I'm saying is that I want him to clear out all the debris in my life and make things smooth and easy. But he ain't going to do that. He's going to say, I'm going to leave the debris there, but I will be with you as you're going through all of this mess in life. And when you hurt, I hurt. But I can heal your hurt. I can heal your disappointment and your pain. David says he's a merciful God. And we don't get what we deserve. The, another example he uses that he removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Infinity. They never touch. So when God says I'm forgiven, I must forgive myself. You know the hardest thing in the world is to forgive yourself. Even when other people forgive you, the enemy will nag your conscience and it's difficult for you to forgive yourself. We deserve rejection, but God gives us acceptance. We deserve his wrath, but we get his mercy. We deserve hell, but he gives us heaven. We deserve the devil, but we get Jesus Christ. God's mercy is over all that we are and all that we do. A lot of people are going to be celebrating Christmas in various ways. Drinking, shooting up with drugs, other things that are not appropriate. Some will be with a large crowd of folk. Others will be in isolation by themselves. But the mass of folk will not be thinking about what is Christmas all about. If you take the word C-H-R-I-S-T-M-A-S and if you get, if you slice the Christ or take the M-A-S, the mass, from the other part, what do you get? Christ. Do you think it was an accident that it was named Christmas? That accident that somebody said, oh, let me see, what can we name this holy day? Oh, I just had a brainstorm. Christmas. That sounds nice. It's named after him. That wasn't an accident. God, he had planned that. And everything, if you notice, it is like with the, in the cowboy movies, when the Indians came to attack wagon trains, what would they do? They would circle and get close together. What? To repel the enemy. Everything in, in terms of the holiday of Christmas circles one person, Jesus Christ. The giving of gifts, Jesus Christ. Christ. 
the singing of the hymns that we so beautifully remember. Jesus Christ, God's mercy, God's grace in his son, Jesus Christ. Does he love me? He sure does. Now, what you have to do, there are going to be moments in your life that Satan is going to tell you he really doesn't love you. If he did love you, he wouldn't allow these bad things to happen. Because a parent, when they love a child, they protect their child, and they don't let what? Bad things happen to their child. Not necessarily so. Because David uses again that illustration where he says, as a father, what? Has pity on his children. So God has pity on us. Why? Because he knows we are what? Frail, fragile. It ain't really, you know what? Can I say it? Can I say it my way? It really ain't a whole lot to us. You can put a $2,000 suit on this dirt, a um, $1,000 pair of shoes on the dirt. You can dress it up, and the dirt will look good. But then after a while, the dirt disintegrates. Why? Because from dust thou art, to dust returneth is the soul. The last question is this. Since the dirt doesn't really mean anything, what happens to the soul after the dirt goes back? Is, does the soul disintegrate? Or does it last? If it does last, how long does it last? Where does it go? These are what we call eternal questions that must be addressed before the dirt goes back to the dirt. Because once the dirt goes back to the dirt, it's too late to make a decision for the soul. Amen? The decision must be made now. Will I take control, or try to take control of my life? Will I try to be the king in my own life? Will I want people to praise me or to tell me that I'm a great man, I'm like Humpty Dumpty, I'm sitting on the wall? But let me tell you, eggs don't stay on walls. Eggs fall off of walls. Amen. Have you heard the expression, when you get to the top, there's not but, but one place to go? Down. If you get to the top with God, you'll stay there. But if you get to the top on your own, it's just a matter of time before you come back down to earth. Wouldn't it be grand if somebody here this morning made a decision for Christ? Not the baby, but I'm talking about the man. I'm talking about Jesus. Why did he come? He just didn't come for us to put up a Christmas tree, a cedar, a spruce, put bells and things on it, and what all the other stuff my mother used to dress up trees sometimes, it would take her two days. He didn't come for us to put um, sprays in the window, wreaths that are hanging up here. That's for our purpose. Why did Jesus come? He came for the soul. 